So uh, we talking about universal screening for non-accidental trauma. Can we eliminate racial disparities? So just a brief background about child maltreatment. Every year, there are about 700,000 children who experience either abuse or neglect. And about 1,800 of those children end up dying from either neglect or abuse. The younger the child are, the children are, the more vulnerable they are. Children under five actually account for over 80% of cases of non-accidental trauma. And abusive head injury is a leading cause of death in children under the age of two. Uh, NAT is a common cause of pediatric hospitalization. It actually comprises nearly 10% of all pediatric trauma admissions. And the consequences of missed cases of child abuse are quite significant. So 10% of child abuse cases actually result in death. And 20% of cases are actually missed at their first presentation. And this is particularly important because, um, as we know, cases of um, repeated child abuse actually present with uh, escalating severity of injury. The difficulty uh, in dealing with child abuse, there are many, but one of them is the, the diagnosis of child abuse. It can often be very subjective. And there's actually no gold standard for the detection or diagnosis of child abuse. Not surprisingly, racial disparities exist as well. Minority children are disproportionately identified in child abuse evaluation workup. They have higher case substantiation rates compared with their white counterparts. And it's controversial whether race is an independent risk factor for child abuse or reflective of underlying SES. The other problem is that case detection is really subject to mandated reporter conscious or unconscious biases. As a consequence, minority children actually constitute a much larger proportion of the child welfare system than they should. So one of the problems in diagnosing child abuse is actually the diagnose, diagnostic process. So if you take a normal disease process, say cancer, a patient comes into your office as a provider and you take a history, you perform an exam, and then in your mind, you kind of come up with a differential diagnosis. You order diagnostic testing, labs, imaging. Ultimately, the patient may go on for a biopsy with pathologic confirmed diagnosis, or they respond to your treatment. And so then you have this feedback loop where you confirm that your thought process made sense and um, you learn from your this process, uh, which will better inform your future diagnostic processes. With child abuse, it's a little different. So a patient presents and a provider will take a history and, and perform a physical exam, they'll look for bruising, and then they'll perform a workup, which often includes a skeletal survey, a homology exam. Certain injuries will be found. They'll find that the story doesn't fit the injury pattern and ultimately a CPS referral is made. The problem is that Really, a provider, any provider can make a CPS referral. And often we use the CPS referral as this, pod, this feedback loop, like, oh, a CPS referral was made, therefore I must have been correct in my assumptions and in my kind of diagnostic reasoning. Problem is that the CPS referral really is not at all the diagnosis. And it's really the first step in a long series of steps where cases are sequentially eliminated. So after a CPS is, referral is made, the case has to decide, be opened or not opened. The case may or may not then be substantiated. A child may or may not then be placed in foster care. And ultimately there's a court adjudication. So this really should be the feedback loop, but the problem is this feedback loop rarely, if ever actually happens to the original provider who made the quote unquote diagnosis. So um, that leads to a lot of problems with the current state. So looking at the current state, specifically at Packard, we have to look at the backdrop in California. So um, incidence rates of child abuse in California are presented here. So the blue line on the left um, figure shows the um, CPS reports rates and the orange line is of substantiation rates. So it's been pretty steady for the last 10 years or so about 50 cases per 1,000 children with a substantiation rate of about 20%. And the figure on the right shows, again, that children under the age of one have the highest incidence um, rate of child abuse as well as substantiation. Um, so how does this California rate 
um, then translate down to a hospital-based reporting rate because this reflects schools or reflects daycare centers as well as hospitals. So we chose to compare to kind of our peer institutions that Children's Hospital of Colorado was um, one of the hospitals we used to benchmark against. And unfortunately, uh, you can see that Packery was substantially lower uh, than our peer institution, uh, even when you control for the surrounding counties. Packard is also substantially lower than our own surrounding counties. Um, our case report rate was 2.7 per 1,000 children, um, which is almost 10 times lower than our surrounding counties. <clears throat> um, of the cases that were reported to CPS from Packard, the majority, 75, nearly 75%, were under the age of five. And this is a particularly important age group because children under the age of five are both at statistically higher risk of abuse, but they're also less likely to be detected by other sources because they're not yet in schools. So that makes the medical system and hospital system particularly important in identifying these kids. What we also saw in looking at our own retrospective data was that 7.6% of children who ultimately received a CPS case report had actually been admitted to Packard once before prior to their CPS report. And 8.5% of children were actually admitted once again after the CPS report. Um, this is the racial breakdown of uh, the children who are identified at Packard. So in the pie graph on the left, this is the um, demographics of the uh, LPCH trauma registry. So these were all children who presented with injuries. And then on the right are those children who were then identified as potential cases of child abuse reported to CPS. I just wanna highlight a few uh, disproportionalities. So if you look at the um, high slivers for black children, they represented 1.7% of our trauma population but 13% of our child abuse population. Similarly, Asians represented 22% of the trauma population, but only 9% of the child abuse population. So our project was, um, had two aims. One, we wanted to improve Packard's CPS reporting rate. And two, we wanted to reduce racial bias in CPS reporting. In this process, um, we analyzed our current screening process, risk assessment and reporting, and then we reviewed the relevant um, literature on existing systems. And ultimately, we implemented a new EMR-based child abuse screening process at Packard. So to start the process, we had to analyze our current state. We compared the current system to national guidelines, and we went um, to look for recommendations for policy changes. Um, and we wanted to make sure that responsibilities were clearly defined, that there was um, easy communication. We wanted to minimize the staff's emotional and operational burden so that this would be widely accepted. And as you can all imagine, child abuse is a very sensitive subject. Even parents who have not at all abused their children are, are very sensitive to this if you bring this up in a hospital setting. So we certainly wanted to minimize parents' suspicion. And then we wanted to create a system where we could um, measure our performance. So as a back, uh, quick background, this very, very complicated workflow was what was considered um, child abuse screening at Packard. Um, and I'm not gonna go over the details, but the, the point is this, at the very starting kind of point, you have, um, it's very subjective already. It relies on a provider to find an injury that is, um, suspicious. It's not, it's not automatically triggered every time. Um, this is a screening uh, tool that's from another children's hospital. Again, I put this up only be to show that it is very, very complicated. There is a lot to sort through in one glance of the screen. You really can't digest everything. And again, it's very subjective at the very first step. It's not applied every time. There was uh, some reference to child abuse concerns in uh, Packard's existing um, admission navigator. There was a box uh, under the admission psychosocial assessment performed by nurses that listed child slash caregiver concerns. The problem with this box, this um, 
you could call it a screening process, was that there was absolutely no indication to the nurse completing this checkbox um, of what to do. What questions were they supposed to ask to elicit the results? How were they supposed to judge and select the appropriate box? And it was entirely optional to complete. Beyond that, even if a nurse checked off certain boxes in this circled area, the information went nowhere. This was not routinely collected. It was not, um, there was no regular monitoring process for this. So the problems with the previous systems that we had in place really were that they were very individually driven, that medical staff had to notice um, warning signs. There was, there was nothing standardized about the screening questions. And then the risk assessment, again, um, relied on multiple different providers with different points of views. Um, and a staff that is already overburdened. So having them complete a very, very long um, workup questionnaire was uh, not really um, very feasible. And then even the reporting of child abuse cases was not clear. There's no clear escalation and uh, protocol to follow. So as a consequence, only 27% of all CPS cases really even got SCAN consults. SCAN is the suspected child abuse and neglect team. So in designing our new um, workflow and our new protocol, what we wanted to do was really design something that could meet a excellent um, standard. And so this is the National Association of Children's Hospitals guidelines for the evaluation of child abuse. And they have guidelines for really what a basic program is, an advanced program, and excellence. And obviously at Stanford, we want to strive for excellence. So we wanted to ensure that we um, came up with a workflow that met all of these requirements. And then in our literature review, again, we found that there was really no validated screening tool, um, that the screening questions either relied on physical exam findings or kind of behavioral inconsistencies. And again, this is just a comparison of Packard on the far right compared to some of the other screening systems that were out there. So the opportunities we were had um, and the next steps were one, to identify screening opportunities from the current nursing questionnaire. Uh, we did a retrospective data analysis on risk factors that predicted child abuse. Uh, we analyzed Packard's operational capacity for implementing these things, and then we wanted to measure their performance. So in the screening part, we really wanted to make sure that every patient went through a standardized screening process, that the process was automated through the EMR and that it could be minimal but effective. Um, in the risk assessment, we wanted to ensure that the assessment protocol was formalized, that there was timely notification to all important stakeholders and that the reporting scheme was uh, clear. We then analyzed all the different parts of patient flow and where patients can enter into the Packard hospital system. So all of those areas are starred there. And then we looked at the burden on the staff. So in one of the scenarios we looked at um, on the far left, if we had a very long nursing questionnaire to really narrow down the group of patients, um, that then got further evaluation, we realized that this would really be a huge burden on the nurse in order to generate few referrals to social work. In the middle scenario, we came up with um, one of the proposals was, well, what if you had very simple referral criteria and you let the social workers who are experts really sort through these referrals? And the problem is then this would cause a very heavy workload for a very already over over um, work, social work system. So in the final kind of process that we came up with, we really wanted a minimal but effective nurse um, administered questionnaire that would generate a manageable number of patients to social work to evaluate, which would then create a very balanced workload between the nursing staff and the social work staff. So it's a lot of work to come up with a very simple framework, but that's the, what we were shooting for. So the very simplified proposed framework was looking at whether or not the child was simply under the age of five. Um, and this is something that the EMR can pull out for us. And then 
If that is true, does this child have an injury and was that injury sustained in a home? And if that's true, then ideally the child abuse team would be notified to investigate and determine the next steps. So this is what the workflow that we developed now looks like, um, and it was built into EPIC. So this is the injury screen workflow that is now built into the required admission documentation in EPIC. When a child under the age of six is admitted to the hospital, there is an injury screening that is automatically incorporated into the required documentation for their admission. Um, so nurses cannot bypass this step. And then when they get to that step, this is what it looks like. There's really two very simple questions. A, is this patient an injured trauma patient? And we even define what an injury is because believe it or not, that engendered many questions of what, what is an injury? And it's a, it's a yes or no question. And then the second question is, is it, if it is an injured patient, where did the injury occur? Care center, home, or other? When a nurse answers yes to whether or not this is an injured patient, an email is sent automatically to our scan team. So this is a copy of the email that Epic generates that's sent automatically, um, actually in multiple formats to our child abuse team. It goes both in email as well as through paging. And then it's also compiled in a master um, patient list uh, within Epic. So the process now works that if there's a child under the age of five, which is screened by the EMR, um, then uh, we figure out if the child was injured in a home. And if that is yes, the child abuse team is automatically notified as I showed you. The child abuse team then reviews the medical record for red flags. This is all done behind the scenes. There is no footprint of them in the medical record so that if a parent views the medical record later on, there is not a note that says child abuse screening. It's all done in the background. If the child abuse team finds red flags or reasons to further investigate the case, then the scan team asks the primary team to formally consult and they will begin documenting their findings. And if the workup is then concerning, then the scan team will file a CPS report. So the next step, uh, we've now that we've implemented this uh, nursing screen, then now the next step really is to um, assess our outcomes. So the hypothesized strengths of our screening program um, is that it's truly universal screening. It's not selectively applied based on whether or not a provider has suspicion. It's applied to every patient every time there's admission to Packard. It is mandatory and it's facilitated by the EMR so that it's easy to complete. Um, there is an automatic real-time notification to trained consultants so this, the step is to um, reduce the potential for bias. Um, and we decrease this, um, again, the potential for individual bias. We target the high-risk population by selecting for children under the age of five, and now this entire process is formalized. So we have yet to kind of measure, we're now kind of in the continued evaluation and, and trying to figure out how to measure the performance. But one of the things that we, in a good test um, that we need is to really have a low uh, false positive rate because that would result in really creating unnecessary stress and breaking up families. And conversely, we also don't want a high false negative rate because missing a case of abuse really um, has uh, pretty significant um, ramifications where children can be sent back to homes where they're experiencing um, repeated and progressive abuse. And then we are trying to come up with what is the appropriate benchmark by which we monitor, um, evaluate our, our um, screening process by. But some of the preliminary findings, so in 2020, since we've um, implemented this process, we've had 114 um, positive injury screens identified through the nurse admission navigator. Of these 114 cases, 51 cases were formally evaluated by the scan team after their behind the scene, uh, scenes review. And out of these cases, nine children were determined to have ha sustained likely abuse. Um, 
93 were ruled out as unlikely and 12 were unsure. 28 case reports, uh, CPS reports were filed and uh, 13 police reports were filed. In looking at the um, injury screen demographics, so the pie chart here shows the racial and ethnic breakdown of the patients who were detected by the injury screen and on the right, you see the payer type. And then this is just a summary table that compares it to the initial two pie charts that I showed you. So trauma patients are on the left. NAT reflects the CPS reports that historically were submitted by Packard. And now you see um, the results of the injury screen. And you can see now, at least with the new injury screen, the demographics more closely represent our trauma population and are not as discrepant or disproportionate as our previous historical controls were. So there's still a lot of work to be done, um, more data to collect and analyze. Um, but the, this is our preliminary findings and I couldn't have done this without a lot of people. I really wanted to thank um, the following people, Annika Claypool, Dupe, who will be joining our residency program in July, and Katie Kahn, who um, is an extraordinary medical student. And then these are all the different folks who've been involved um, with hundreds of hours of stakeholder interviews and approvals at the nursing leadership level, CNO, um, and social work staff. So I will stop here. Thank you all for your time.